Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with Jeffrey K. Lee, General Manager of the Howard University Television. Jeffrey has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Jeff, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So you run a very important public service, WHUT, within the context of Howard University. You provide this public media uh, service to the entire community. Talk about some of the challenges of running such a, such a valuable institution. Some of the specific challenges of running a television station with a university is that university at its core is a mission-driven uh, organization for educating students. And on the other side, the television station has a mission to educate the public. It's so education is at the core of both sides of it. And um, Howard University has a specific mission in educating not just minority students or black or African-American students, but anybody who comes here. And it's the same mission for the public television station that Howard University has, which we are here at WHUT. So the challenges that we may have are challenges that I think that are faced by any organization, uh, university and um, television station or uh, uh, radio station, whatever the case may be. But we don't have the conflict of mission that they might have. Uh, where one may be a commercial entity, where the university is a not-for-profit. So we're a not-for-profit. University is a not-for-profit. We, uh, we actually have the same 50C3 designation, so we're all under the same cap. The benefits, I mean, the reason I came to the station were not because of the challenges that the station faced, but because of the benefits that it offered. The station, I mean, the university does something that I consider to be unique in broadcasting and that it has this appendage called the university or the station has this appendage that creates content all day every day. They may call it classrooms and they may call it um, syllabus for the class but it's really content. Then how do we repurpose that content? How can we repurpose that content to not just disseminate it in the classroom or in online learning, but we can also take it and put it on television and put it online in the websites that we have on public media. So it, it, it was the allure of being able to take a content-driven organization with a content distribution platform of what television is and marry them together and give the community something from best of both worlds. So this kind of mission is different than in a commercial setting in which the transformative effect is incidental. A mm -hmm. commercial station must generate profit at the end of every quarter. Whether society is transformed thereby or not is just incidental. Whereas your focus is in the transformative impact of how media can be used as opposed to profit. Yeah, I, I, I look at it, I, I've had the opportunity to work in commercial broadcasting as well as in public broadcasting now and the nonprofit sector. And I've also had the opportunity to work in privately owned media and publicly owned media. And pu being a public company, it forced you to be a little shorter term in your view of what success was, quarter to quarter, like you said. And earlier. what would generate revenue. And what so, would generate revenue. So if, a, if a, a show would generate revenue and another show would not generate revenue, where do you go? Well, that's it. It's, it's, it's not it's, as it's easy, easy as it sounds, <laughs> though, because as, as you will learn as you expand on that, you get to do what you call, what are called lost leaders. Right. You get to put some programs on that for-profit network that doesn't necessarily drive the bottom line, but if you have the uh, desire to want to be a messenger for a broader uh, topic or a community, you can do that, but you can't have a whole lot of lost leaders running right. in there with that. Whereas with public media, the whole issue is to drive the message. It's, it's, it's about, it's not to drive the message as much as it is to drive the opportunity for the messages to flow. And that's what I, I, I say a lot about what we do here. We don't create the town square 
But what we do is we walk into the town square and put what I call a milk crate in the middle of the town square and allow our citizens to go stand on top of that milk crate. So in the midst of all the discussion that's going on, you can be heard because you have a platform, you have a vehicle to be heard. And But we don't allow just one person to stay on the platform. When you say what you say, you come down and somebody else comes up. And that's what public media does. It allows the opportunity for voices to be heard. And it's voice to the voiceless. It is voice to the voiceless. It is voice to leadership as well. Uh, one of the things I really like about what we are here and we are positioned in the nation's capital, where um, people who can make decisions that affect other people's lives can hear and see what we do. So that we have the opportunity not to allow, not only to allow the voiceless to to, to be heard, but the people who have to hear the voiceless, to hear them. What also is interesting to me is that is that how you make decisions is really affected by the character of the station. I'll take, for example, the talking heads right now who are on the left or the right, Republican, Democrat, red, blue, whatever you want to call them. That yelling at each other attracts attention. Mm -hmm. If you had two people on a quarter yelling at each other, everybody would pay attention. So because it attracts attention, because it attracts eyes, there's so much what, what goes for news that really is about uh, bringing together two people who are articulate yellers <laughs> and having them yell in front of a camera. Yes. It's a performance, but nothing gets done. Right, and it, it, it goes back to purpose though. Uh, what we see a lot and what we call news is not really news, it's opinion discussions. There's my opinion, there's his opinion, there's her opinion. We all sit around, they all sit around the table and give their opinion. Or it's beautifully wrapped uh, promotional material to promote a particular pre-paked idea or message mm -hmm. that is wrapped up in a nice little news, news looking pa package. It is, it's all about packaging out there in that world. But the responsibility here, this is what I do every night when I go home. I, I, I evaluate how I did based on the responsibility that I carry that the community has given me. The responsibility to make the decisions of what is on the channel and what's not on the channel and how we put it on the channel. That's a huge responsibility that goes to everyone in this um, public media space that you have to carry. And I, I take that responsibility seriously. Uh, I think as we celebrate the 50th year of public television now, it, it's it's been a up and down ride with public television, but I would like to say, look at where we may be if there had not been public television. And that's the way I look at the progression and where we need to go with. As we sit here today, um, the issues that we face in the country today, partially um, generated by the camps that we go into in our media discussions. Right that there needs to be that place in the town square where everybody can be heard and not just the people who have the facilities or the ability. I mean, we're a community station. We have sometimes there are discussions here in the studios that aren't televised, but it just allows the community to come in and talk to one another, not just talk at one another or listen to one another. Uh, but to talk with one another. And sometimes it turns into television shows. Uh, it, it gives us the opportunity also, and, and I like this, I mean, sometimes people call us the black public television station because we're Howard University, HBCU, the black television station. Well, I like to turn that around, that label around, and, and describe what that means is that there are people of color making decisions of what goes on television, not necessarily just people who show up in front of the screen, but people who make decisions about what goes on on television. And it's, they are able to bring different backgrounds to that decision. And that is very important in that decision-making process. It, a lot is predicated on where I stand. I mean, somebody mentioned to me once that you can go outside after a rain and see a rainbow and you can ask the person sitting or standing next to you, hey, do you see that rainbow? And they go, wow, yes, I see the rainbow, but in reality, it's not the same rainbow because of how refraction works and everything else. That person may be taller or shorter than you, so the light refracts a different way. They see a different rainbow than you see. So what we see is predicated on where we stand. 
And we've got to be able to stand in a lot of different places or allow people who are standing in different places to say, yes, I see the rainbow, but it's, it's a different rainbow than the one that you see. We don't all have to agree. That would be the worst thing for us if we all agreed all the time. But we got to allow the voice to be heard. And then we can make the decisions on whether we agree with it or not. But what's happening now is everybody say, hey, I'm going to this camp because they're closer aligned with what I already believe. Right. And this right. one's what I already believe. And nobody goes to the middle and say, well, what, is, what does everyone believe here? And then I can make my decision. I think it goes to the other thing that public media is driving to do is bring back citizenship. And civility. And c civility, but also the responsibility of citizenship. You have a responsibility as a citizen, not just to go to your camp or to this other camp, but to listen to all of these things. That's what citizenship is all about. And so we wanna have that, or it is one of the pillars of public media now. Uh, safety, we're doing a lot of things right now with um, uh, first responders, and public media is allowing its um, frequencies to be used in first responders. Here in Washington, we, we had an event a couple of years ago that should have shaken all of us to the core where we actually had an earthquake here in Washington, D.C. And everybody had a cell phone, but what happened? They got overused and they were useless. But what was on and stayed on during the whole time? It was television. And so with data casting, we've done some things over the last couple of years working with park police, where every time there's a event, major event on the mall or downtown Washington, we allow the park police to use a part of our spectrum to use, do something called data casting, where they are able to send video to command centers all, uh, at one location and look all around the city to, uh, to different things that are going on. So public media has, along with its educational uh, uh, approach, it has the public safety approach that public media is, re is, is responding to. It also has this, <coughs> excuse me, citizenship component. So all of those things, they may not drive you to a bottom line profit, but they drive us to a bottom line of citizenship that can allow us to become better at everything that we do in this country. You're part of the fabric of the community, in other Absolutely. words. Absolutely. In terms of how um, public television works, um, some people um, mistakenly believe that it's organized the way a commercial sta a network would be organized, and then just fund it out of the public purse. But that's not true. Uh, why don't you describe how public television functions, how you make your decisions, um, even what you had said, that, that, that there's no sort of voice down from on high that you must broadcast pretty much anything. Right. right? And, 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 and how that, that all functions. Well, there is a, something called the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which is a not-for-profit not organization funded by the federal government to the tune of about $444 million a year, which is there to be divided up between public television stations, television, radio, and, and, and create content as well, not only just to give dollars to the stations for operational purposes and so forth, but also to create content. But that $440 million sounds like a lot of money, but it's a small portion of what it takes to run a television station. I used to tell people all the time, I say, you know, my electric, you know, Pepco doesn't charge me less because I'm nonprofit than the for-profit station. So the electricity that we use and all the other utilities and things that go into running a television station, a not-for-profit, are the same. But the editorial part of it, we as an organization have agreed on certain standards that we will right. go by and adhere to. So it, it functions in part as a funding mechanism, so partly funding. Uh, partly a content creator to bind the the organization together, as well as set standards, it's which standard. also, and, and and it becomes a resource, a clearinghouse for those stations that need support. Exactly, and there's many levels of stations within the system. I mean, there are the uh, primary stations that they call um, major market stations, all the way down to small market stations where they they just don't have the same resources as they have in major markets, but the the beautiful thing about it is every one of those stations, over 300 stations, have at its core 
the control being central, I mean localized and not centralized, right. so that they can respond to their audience. What are the needs in this audience here in our community? So when you are, are thinking about how, about your decisions, about where you invest your scarce dollars and where you uh, program your airtime, you're not getting some sort of down from on high message Right? Not you're, at all. You're taking, taking counsel from your people here, the community, the university, the needs that are here locally. Exactly, because like I said earlier, some of the um, ways in which the, the organization works is if you were funding me to a certain extent, you can't have editorial control of programs that we right. air here. So you can't, uh, oh, I want to do a program with this position and then say, I'll give you a check that would fund them. Well, no, you can't connect those two. You've got to give that funding because you believe that what this organization does in total is something that you agree with. I heard a comment a couple of years ago in the county in which I live that about approximately 60% of the county's budget goes to schools, where there was only about 20% of the people who lived in the county actually had kids in, school, in public schools. But there was a belief within the county that a educated citizenry was important to them. So they would be willing to take 60% of their dollars to spend on public education when most of them don't use public education, but they benefit from what public right. education does. And that's the way public television works in, in my mind when it works well is that the citizenry, and we don't call our viewers uh, consumers, we call them citizens. So our citizenry looks at what public television offers and says as a whole, I like that and I think that's important to the community that I live in, that that exists and I want to support that and I want to continue to have that grow in my community. And so it is very important that that exists from the outside in. It, it, the, the decisions that are made inside in terms of what we program is a big wheel of things that have to go into place on that. Um, from inside, outside, uh, people that are involved, people that are not involved, people that disagree. We want to hear that uh, perspective as well. And then we make those decisions of what programming we do. And it's not possible to purchase airtime to get you to associate your programs with my desire to sell beer not into at all. the community. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, th that's another very important aspect in that because of the nature of your model, the, the model itself is not for sale. So if, if, if I want to associate your news program with my beer or, or uh, a, a public service program, with my uh, desire to sell cars. And I think that, that um, your coverage of technology might make my car look better. I can't purchase that space because from your editorial perspective, this is, that is tilting the table in a mm -hmm. way that you would not embrace. Exactly. Now, a commercial station would, would naturally, if that's the price the is right. They're in. That's, that's the, the business, business they're, they're in. That's the business that they're in, and we're not in that business. What we would say to somebody like that car dealer is that you could look at our audience and say these are the people you know, these are the people that buy cars. We know that they buy cars and we know that they do they are concerned about their community and we want to show as a good customer or I mean as a good business in the community, we're concerned about those things as well. So we want our brand associated with programs or with that TV channel that puts that kind of programming on. So we can do brand identity, but we won't do a ask order. You can't do a commercial where you can ask for the buy or ask for the sale or something like yeah, that. Yeah, somebody, somebody can say we, so wh when you look at, at, for example, McDonald's and their support of Ronald McDonald House, it is perfectly okay to say we support this philanthropic institution. It's perfectly okay for citizens. In fact, you want citizens want to citizens. say we want to, to support WHUT or Howard University or organizations, um, Bread for the City, organizations that, that, uh, that house the homeless and, and feed children. You want people to stand up. Exactly. And that's different than, than an exchange, a transaction in which I'm buying your airtime to sell my product. Absolutely. It, it's, it's like 
I, 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 I ran into a young lady a couple of weeks ago who won a contest. There, there's a film uh, being made uh, by Stanley Nelson's called Tell Them We Are Rising. It's, about, it's the story of HBCUs. And a young lady at Howard University won an essay contest about where you wrote what are your experiences, about your experiences at an HBCU. And when I read her essay, her essay was more about a feeling than a place. Yes, Howard University is a place, and she broke it down to a particular couple of places. But the overall issue was about a feeling that Howard University created for her. And I thought it was so apropos to what public media is, is that yes, there's a TV station, there's a TV program, but there's a feeling about community involvement that's created by public media. And as a citizen, I want to be involved in my community, and I have that feeling. So if you have that feeling about what public media offers and delivers, then you want to be associated with something that creates that feeling inside you. So let's talk a little bit about the physical space. You have excellent facilities. You have an excellent crew here. Uh, talk about uh, how many studios you have, what other facilities you have. Um, how you put together this wonderfully talented team? Well, the building has four studios in it. One of the studios, which we call Studio A, is primarily used for the School of Communications for students here at the university. They do a lot, of most of their work in Studio A. We have Studio B, which is dormant right now. We're not doing much out of there, but in Studio C, and in Studio D, where we're located now, is our primary, they're our primary workhorses for the programs that we create here at WHUT now. We are, um, our programming in this market there, like I said earlier, two other PBS stations, but our programming offering is about 51% different from what they do. And what we have here is, like I said, the three, the two studios that we use as our workhorse, we do that. We have a great crew, as you said, but we, the one thing I really like about what we have is we have a combination that we can work with the students as well as professionals in the industry. And we have something here at HUT and at Howard that's not necessarily unique, but I think it's important here is that a lot of the professionals that work here are alumni of Howard. They have gone to school here, they got their training here, they went to other places around the country and worked, and then came back, some just because they wanted to give back, some just because they have brought in new technologies and new um, uh, uh, experiences that they want to also give to the students here. So we have that, and we have a support from the administration that understands that what the mission is here, that the mission here is the same mission at the university, and we try wherever we can to mesh the operational part of it with the students, with the professors. I'll give you another example. Um, we have the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King coming up. So internally, we were talking about what we would do to commemorate that. And so there was the normal discussion about the IDs and the promos about Dr. King and you know doing all of those, but there was this discussion about most of the people in the country weren't alive when Dr. King was assassinated. So what does it really mean to those people? So the discussion started to go off into, so how can we find those people? We said, we got a law school here at Howard University, and we've got millennials who go to that law school. And that law school was developed and designed by um, Charles Hamilton to not just have academic lawyers come out of there, people who knew the law, but people who knew how the law was applied and the effect that it had on people's lives. And so we've come up with the idea that we, we will have law students at, from the uh, Howard University School of Law to sit down at a table like you and I sitting down here today and talk about what that means. Did 1968 and, 19, I mean, in 2018, are they different or are they a lot alike? And what happened? What does it mean to you? So because when someone of our age say Dr. King's assassination, we remember where we were when we heard it. 
Well, people, there's more people in the country that weren't alive when that happened, so they don't have that memory, and it means something different to them. So we're going to offer that up. But we're also going to do another program where we're going to have people who were alive on that day because it was so impactful to them, and it did mean so much to them, and so in some instances changed their lives. So we're going to look at those kinds of um, perspectives of a particular issue, and I think the uniqueness of Howard University that we have here. It affords us the ability to do that, excuse me, like no other can. Uh, we did a program a couple of years ago uh, down at Constitution Hall was the 75th anniversary of Marian Anderson not being able to sing there. But here at Founders Library, Library, we found documents that said that concert was originally supposed to be here at How Howard University. But the, uh, it, it grew so fast that there was no facility here on the university to house it. So that's when they went to Constitution Hall to try to have it there. And then they were turned down and the daughter, rest is daughter history. Of, right. Daughters of the American Revolution turned it down and they ended up on the steps of the uh, Lincoln Memorial. But that's what Howard University, the connection that we have with Howard University and the community here, because thus, that was a community meeting that those papers showed. It wasn't the university doing it, it was a group from the community that was putting together that, um, that uh, uh, concert. And so that's the essence of what public media is. And that's me. what makes this such a rich vehicle, as impactful as Dr. King's work and life and the people surrounding him were on me, as a white man, I would not necessarily have the perspective to create that type of a exposure and, and the type of experience that others would have. And those voices must be heard. It is incumbent upon us all as citizens to ensure that we make room to be exposed to those other voices and that we assert our voice also in the process of, of taking our turn on that soapbox. Absolutely. And you're providing the soapbox so that those voices can be exposed to the public. Jeff Lee, thank you so much for sharing the work of WHUT. Thank you so, so much for sharing the work of Howard University. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thanks for having me.